A young couple's toxic relationship led to tragedy. An investigation reveals that things were not as simple as they seemed, and the family's dark secrets continue to come to light. Nahir Galarza was born on September 11, 1998, in the city of Gualaguaychú, Argentina, which has a population of about 100,000 people. This city borders Uruguay and is famous for its carnival. Nahir was a very outgoing, fun-loving girl from childhood. She had a brother, Aaron, who was three years younger than her. Her brother was developmentally delayed and had a hard time learning, unlike her sister. He was later diagnosed with a disability. Nahir did well in school and learned languages easily. Their family was exemplary, strong, and happy. The house was always in perfect order. The mother taught her children cleanliness from childhood. Nahir was obsessed with cleaning and order. Hand washing became a habit for her. Her father was a policeman. Her parents were not strict. On the contrary, they spoiled their children very much. Nahir dreamed of becoming a lawyer and after graduating from high school, she entered the university to study law. Nahir loved sports and went to workouts and massages every day to maintain a perfect figure. Nahir had many friends with whom she went to parties. In 2012, at the age of 14, she met 15-year-old Fernando Pastorizzo at a bowling alley. Fernando was born on January 3, 1997, in the same city Gualaguaychú, Argentina. He was a good, funny, and active boy from a decent family. He loved animals and was fond of Nahir. The teenagers started dating, and their relationship was complicated. They often fought and broke up, but after a few days, they were together again. They were both jealous and did not trust each other, which was the reason for their conflicts. In 2016, they took a trip to Brazil with Nahir's family, which went very well. They hardly fought and enjoyed their vacation. Things seemed to be getting better, but the problem only grew. They kept fighting, breaking up and then making up. On Christmas Eve 2017, the couple went to party at the very same bowling alley. Fernando, 20, and Nahir, 19, were vacationing there separately with their friends. As it turned out, they had an argument before the party, and that's why they were not there together. In a bowling alley, there was a fight between Fernando and another guy, Rafael. What the fight was about is not quite clear, because the versions of Nahir, Fernando, and their friends are different. Fernando wrote to his friends that he was severely beaten, and Nahir said that Fernando was just jealous of another guy and attacked him. On December 28, 2017, Nahir went to get a massage, and after the massage, she discovered that her phone was dead. She remembered that she had left the charger at Fernando's house. The girl went to his house and stayed there. At night, Fernando took her home on his motorcycle, and at dawn, Fernando was found bleeding by a passing taxi driver. The taxi driver called the police and an ambulance. By the time the ambulance arrived, it was too late and he was dead. Police officers who arrived at the scene found Fernando shot twice near his motorcycle and two helmets lying nearby. The news spread quickly, and at 7 o'clock in the morning, Nahir, who woke up to find out, posted a picture of her and him together on her social media page, captioning it, Five years together, quarrels and breakups, reconciliations, but always with love. I love you forever, my angel. Fernando's mother called to ask what had happened, but Nahir did not know what had happened. Police officers began collecting evidence at the scene and investigating the murder. The initial theory of robbery was rejected because no money had been taken from Fernando. It was a quiet, safe neighborhood with a low crime rate. But who could have killed the guy? Who could have had a motive? It turns out that Fernando was shot with a 9mm handgun that's a gun usually only used by police officers. Could some policeman have killed him? It was also determined that the guy was first shot from behind at close range. He was probably giving someone a ride from behind and was shot. Then he fell off the bike. The perpetrator walked up to him and shot him in the heart from the front. 
Could it have been someone he knew? This version was confirmed by the presence of a second helmet. The police began to study the footage from all the surveillance cameras in the area and found a girl leaving the place at 522 whose face was not visible. Nahir became a suspect and was called in for questioning. She confidently stated that Fernando had taken her home that night. She took a shower, went to bed, and woke up at 7 a.m. to find out about the tragedy. Then she posted stories about how sorry she was for Fernando. Nahir looked very upset and cried. The investigators had no more questions for her. The police decided to question her father, a policeman who was a colleague of theirs, and he told them that he did not know any Fernando. But that turned out not to be true. Later, photos were found from their trip to Brazil together, where they were all in the same picture. Nahir's father knew Fernando very well, and it is unclear why he lied. The police suggested that the father might have been involved in the crime, and that's why he lied that he didn't know the guy. They were just working on the theory that the policeman was involved because of the gun. Then the father's gun was taken for examination, and it turned out that it was the gun that had been used to shoot Fernando. Nahir's father became a prime suspect. Investigators speculated as to what his motive might have been. Probably, the father did not like the relationship between his daughter Nahir and Fernando, and he could have gotten angry and shot the boy. Nahir confessed to Fernando's murder to protect her father, who was about to be arrested. She claimed that she was a victim of physical violence from the guy that night. He grabbed her by the hair and took her home, so she shot him. But how could she even have a gun? It was clearly a planned crime since she took the gun off her person. As it turned out, Nahir stole her father's service pistol from the refrigerator and put it back after the murder. Her parents did not suspect her of anything. Nahir was captured on surveillance footage. The police asked her why she then ran away and tried to cover all traces, did not call the police or the ambulance. If it was not her fault, Nahir replied that she was confused at that moment. She did not think Fernando would die and did not realize the seriousness of the situation. When she found out that she had killed him, she was very upset. Her friends and his friends gave conflicting accounts. Her friends blamed Fernando for everything as Nahir complained about him all the time. The guy's friends saw everything as Nahir. Some stated that it was hard to call them a couple because they spent much more time separately than together. Nahir had five other guys she was dating and Fernando probably had other girls too. Fernando's and Nahir's correspondence was analyzed and from their messages, it seemed that Fernando was more likely to be the victim in this relationship. Nahir was very aggressive and threatened him. And the soft and kind Fernando complained to his friends that he was beaten up when he wanted to break up with Nahir. He was tired of this relationship and just wanted a quiet life without her. This may have been the reason why Nahir decided to kill him, because she wanted to get back at him for Fernando wanting to break up with her. Nahir later claimed that she accidentally shot the guy while holding the gun. Allegedly, they both fell off the motorcycle onto the ground, and that's when the gun went off the first time. Then she raised the gun, and it accidentally shot him again. That didn't sound at all plausible. The ballistics expert denied any possibility of two accidental shots. Even if the first shot had been accidental, the second was definitely intentional. In addition, surveillance cameras show that she walked home at a normal pace. She walked more than 20 blocks. She was not in the state of shock and confusion she claimed to be in after the random shots were fired. A graphological examination was conducted. The expert determined that Nahir has a significant emotional imbalance with egocentric manipulative traits. Her handwriting reflects egocentrism, a desire for attention, a tendency toward extreme mood and behavioral swings, impulsivity, aggressiveness, a propensity to lie, dominance, and manipulativeness. The signature shows that there is an important emotional imbalance that she was trying to hold on to, and she failed. Judging by the handwriting, 
Nahir is not as simple as it seemed at first glance. The girl has a very contradictory, complex, bossy, and aggressive character. As it turned out, at the age of 16, she decided to play a joke on her parents by staging her own kidnapping. Her terrified parents were shocked when they found out it was a prank. Before the trial, the girl was sent for a psychiatric evaluation. The psychiatrist concluded that she was sane. She is an absolute narcissist, irascible, aggressive, and does not repent or regret anything she has done. She was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder due to obsession with frequency. At the trial, Nahar behaved in a very defiant manner. She came in wearing shorts and looked at everyone with arrogance and dislike. Constantly fixing her hair and flirting with everyone while continuing to insist that it was self-defense. However, no one believed her version. The girl's mother defended her and her father later disowned his daughter, but there was no evidence that Nahir was physically abused by Fernando. The prosecution voiced its version of what happened. At around 2 a.m., Fernando drove his girlfriend home. When they arrived, they went into Nahir's room and argued there for about two hours. Fernando wanted to part with her, but she was against it. The girl discreetly took her father's gun and they drove somewhere. When they were passing through an empty, dark street, Nahir asked him to stop. She got off the motorcycle and shot him in the back. Fernando fell and she shot him again, then left for home. At home, she took a shower, washed off the blood spatter and gunpowder residue on her hands, put her father's gun back on the refrigerator, changed her clothes, and went to bed. Nahir was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility after 35 years. She could be released at the age of 54. Nahir became the youngest prisoner in Argentina to be sentenced to life imprisonment. The girl filed three appeals, but they were all denied and the verdict stood. Now the 23-year-old girl claims that she is not guilty at all and that the murderer was her father who fired his gun. But then how did the father not get on the surveillance footage at all? But they did capture Nahir, who was supposedly at home at the time. Then what was she doing there? Her mother divorced her father and claims to believe her daughter. Nahir states that she was afraid of her father and her uncle who raped her. So she took the blame. And her father was abusive and she is now afraid for her mother and brother. She filed a lawsuit against her uncle. This case received a wide public resonance. There were practically no indifferent people among the local residents. Some support Nahir to this day and believe in her innocence, while others believe the opposite. Nahir not only took Fernando's life, but she destroyed her life, her future, and the future of her brother, who will have no one to take care of him after his parents die. His parents had hoped that Nahir would help him because he is disabled and cannot take care of himself. But unfortunately, she let her family down 